If you brought your Bibles, you can flip open, uh, we'll eventually wind up in James, and so you can get to James chapter 1 in your Bibles. We do have uh, pretty much all the scriptures on the screen, but it's really good for us to also have the book in hand and be familiar with the text and where it is in the Word. Um, And we're just, for the sake of time today, uh, we have a special Sunday today. The Lord is just... um, kind of put a special message on my heart, and so we're going, for the sake of time, we're just going to get right into the word today. So will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, uh, we thank you for the way you've led our church, Um, not only for the 12 years that I've been here, but the seven years before that, and you've always been faithful, Lord, and, um, and Lord, we just... We just hear your call, we read your word, and we just see your desires, and, and then, Lord, you just, just put your dreams in our hearts, Lord, and, um, and so, Lord, just as we kind of step out in faith today in some direction, or at least praying in a direction, we pray that you would um, just move in hearts, God, and give callings on lives, um, and, Lord, just... Uh, put at ease, maybe those that aren't there yet, and, um, but just, uh, Lord, give us open hearts to hear what you might have to say to us today, and let us be a church that just represents you more than well here in Prineville and here in Crook County, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got a little trivia question for you. <clears throat> what do the following people have in common? <laughs> seal You guys know Seal, right? The the singer. See seen Kissed by a Rose? Kissed by a Rose. Okay. Seal Share I know where you're going with the, I know, I knew Shelly, I knew All right, so Seal Share Babe Ruth Did they all have candy bars named after them? James Dean, Louis Armstrong, Marilyn Monroe, John Lennon, Eddie Murphy. It's getting harder, isn't it? You're like, no candy bars, more than one name. Bill Clinton, Steve, (laughs) Democrats. (laughs) Uh, You got me, yep. Special message for today is that we all, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Steve Jobs, nope, not that. (laughs) Willie Nelson, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, Jesus Christ. They were all Time Magazine's person of the year. (laughs) You guys are fun today. Sometimes I'm doing this stuff and you're like, Um, All of these people were a part of the foster care system. They were all in orphanages and or were adopted. Marilyn Monroe even spent two nights in an orphanage and wrote, I began to cry, please, (laughs) please. Boy, this is going to be a long message, I can tell you. (laughs) Please, please don't make me go inside. I'm not an orphan. My mother's not dead. I'm not an orphan. It's just that she's sick and in the hospital and can't take care of me. Please don't make me live in an orphan's home. Or Eddie Murphy, who said in Big Mama's house, no, I'm kidding, that's... (laughs) Sometimes you have to do that just to... (laughs) He doesn't look back fondly on this time as a foster child, but he said, those were bad days. Staying with her was probably the reason I became a comedian. And what about Jesus? Well, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, the birth of Jesus is as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. 
Then Joseph, her husband, listen to this phrase, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But when he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus. And it goes on to say in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, And Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took, him, uh, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so the Christmas story, we're kind of just coming out of that season, the Christmas story is an adoption story. And our kind of main text today is from James chapter 1 verse 27 that tells us pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, James has this great theme about it as a New Testament book that faith without works is dead. Okay, I remember growing up in a Baptist church and a special song they did on a Sunday was uh, like a big acapella band and they all sang, faith without works is like a screen door on a submarine. (laughs) All right? Faith without works is dead, okay? And uh, in James chapter 1, verse 22, we're told to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one is blessed in what he does. And so there's this great call in the book of James to be doers of what we read in the Bible, okay? Um, The faith that saves, uh, it's a faith alone that saves. It's by grace through faith. And so faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone, all right? It is accompanied by many good and godly works in response to the gospel. One, you know, as, the, as this verse says, pure and undefiled religion, a lot of times we balk at that because it has the word religion in it. Some taboo conversations around the family holiday table are politics and religion, right? The world doesn't like to talk about religion, but biblical religion is good religion. It is an outward expression of our faith that's inside of us. It's been said that religion is the external workings of God's grace working internally, So all that God is doing inside of our hearts, a good New Testament Christian religion, is that he has transformed us in the gospel. He's made us new creations, and now we're living out that new life prepared for good works so that we could walk in them. Of course, many say that religion is useless. Many that we might talk to out in the world would say they're not interested in religion, that wars are fought because of it, and religious people are very self-righteous, and we couldn't agree with you more on that, but we want to talk about the religion that the Bible speaks us that is a pure religion, that is an undefiled religion. Certainly, there are external displays out there that bear no internal uh, reality of transformation in the gospel. But there is a type of religion that God finds acceptable. And I remember a season in my life where I hated that word religion, you know. You look at the Pharisees and they just practice the three R's of 
uh, rules and rituals and religiosity, you know, and they were condemned in their ritual. They had made themselves look very pious on the outside, but they never had the, the Lord Jesus change the inside of their heart. It wasn't something that was happening from the inside out with those religious people. It was merely out. And so in that season that I was learning that, I used to say, I'm not into religion, I'm into a relationship with Jesus. And of course, that's a good thing, relationship with Jesus. But perhaps what may be better and more biblical would be to say, I'm in a religious relationship. (laughs) All right? Because God has called us towards obedience in many good and godly things. Something that I just want to address in this verse before I get into my point is that James is not saying here that we can reduce religion to simply charity and morality. James has no intention here to reduce Christianity, religion, to just purity of conduct combined with a form of generosity or benevolence. And if you just kind of live a morally clean life and you're generous, then you're saved and you're not going to hell and you're right with God. That's not the gospel. That's works-based righteousness. That's morality. And many other religions have that. Uh, James is not saying here that acceptance with God is found by those who are just honest and kind. Earlier on in this text of James 1, James already points out that it's by God's grace that we're saved, that it's by his unmerited, unearned favor towards us in Jesus Christ, that he has made us his own people so that we can now bear the family likeness and just Where we find that, so we've been reading in verse 27, but we want to back out from verse 27 and look at the panorama of the whole of chapter 1. Where are the high spots? Where are the pivotal pieces? Where does it turn in chapter 1? And one of the high places, the Everest, is in verse 18. Not only the key to the chapter, but perhaps to the whole book of James where it says in 118, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So before we get into any talk about religion that's pure and undefiled and has all kinds of goodly actions that follow it, first of all, we need to be born again. Okay, We need to be saved. We need to become a part of the family of God. We have a birth where we're brought forth, as it says, by his will. We're born again. God has chosen us for a new birth. That shows his initiative. One man said the believer's regeneration or being born again is the highest example of nothing but good proceeding from God. It's a work of God that changes us and then moves us towards great action for him. Those actions are, spo- are, are born out of and spurred forth out of his great love for us and his great actions to us. And so he has chosen us to give us a birth that shows his initiative. <clears throat> it was through the word of his truth there in verse 18, shows us the instruments that he's used to do that in us so that we might be his first fruits, which shows his intention. So we have his initiative, his instrument, and his intention for us. In verse 18 of chapter 1, we see the new birth. In verses 19 through 25, we see the new life that we've been given. And then in verses 26 and 27 here, we see the characteristics of that new life. And so with that, we jump into kind of the, uh, the call for us today that I believe the Lord has for us in his word. This call is born out of that truth that it was by his will that he birthed us forth to new birth, to new life, from, from dead works and religiosity that, that causes us to perish in our sin, to a new birth by the Holy Spirit, changing us from the inside out so that now we can walk a life motivated by the good news of what Jesus has done for us. That new life kind of is summarized in verses 26 and 27. It shows that we have a controlled tongue now. It shows that we have a compassionate heart now. And it shows that we have a clean life now. And I want to just in a kind of a special Sunday that is sort of topical, you know, it's not 
kind of how it usually goes at Calvary Chapel. Topical is not bad as long as you're using the word as the scaffolding to bring forth the point, all right? Uh, and so in this topic, I want to just narrow it down. There's a lot of good things we could talk about. Maybe we need to talk about having a clean tongue and good speech in this church. Maybe we need to talk about caring for the widow a little bit more. Maybe that is true, but I feel like the Lord has a word for us today concerning a compassionate heart for orphans. Clean and pure and undefiled religion. This is good religion. This is the good stuff, all right? This is the stuff that comes from being born again. It's the stuff that comes from knowing Jesus. It's the stuff that comes from meditating on we were sinners destined for hell. We were all going to perish for all of eternity, and the wrath of God was upon us. There was a middle wall of separation separating us from our creator, but God, who is rich in mercy, he came and pursued us and tore down the middle wall of separation so that we could have a new start, a fresh start, a new birth. We could be born again and be new creations in Christ Jesus. That's good news. That's something to get excited about. That's something to be thrilled about. And that's something that should lead us toward, you know, loving others and, and repaying that out of thankful hearts. And so something that we see there is that we will, in this new birth, visit orphans. The word visit here means to look after. <clears throat> look after orphans. It means in the literal language, select carefully. To take care of them. To be present in their lives. To inspect them. To go and see them. Literally, in the Greek, it means to seek them out. So pure, pure, and undefined. And by the way, this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is something that if you've been born again, you will do this. Okay? This is pure religion. And it is seeking out orphans in their time of trouble in their time of affliction, their time of distress and tribulation. A modern translation in the 1940s, J.B. Uh, Phillips said, religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans. One man said, James is working the principle out that if we are going to bear the family likeness, then we need to be marked with a genuine concern for those in society that are helpless. James doesn't limit the need to widows and orphans, but he's identifying kind of the epitome of human need. You know, we got single moms and the sick and the paralyzed that need help too, but Orphans and widows, it's kind of like the epitome of people that need help. To look out and to seek after the orphans. In Matthew 19, it says in verse 13, little children were brought to Jesus that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked the little children. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I think King James Version says, suffer the little children to come to me. And maybe you're here today and you're like, yeah, that word fits. <laughs> Just don't really like kids too much. Suffer them, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's old school English, okay? Just uh, so like soften the, off those rough edges this morning a little bit. Because Jesus said, let them come to me and do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. In Mark 9.37, it says, whoever receives one of these Little children in my name receives me. Think of that. Pure and undefiled religion before the Lord is to seek after orphans. And the words of Jesus are that if you receive little children in the name of Jesus and for the purpose of the gospel, you are receiving Jesus. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So there's kind of this good chain that happens in this reception. Receiving orphans, being a part of what God's doing in the gospel. 
Receiving the gospel, receiving what the Father has begun to work from the very beginning of time through the gospel. In Matthew chapter 25, at the Olivet Discourse, and speaking about the end times, it says, then the king will say to those in his right hand, by the way, this is a, a judgment in the end of days, the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So when we receive the orphan, and this is kind of the context of today, when we take care of the orphan, we're doing it for Jesus. When we receive them, we are receiving Jesus. And we are to help the orphan and the widow because they are helpless. It's been said taking time to show an interest in people who can never pay you back is the purest form of service to God. Look at what the law had to say about it in Deuteronomy 10, 18. It's that God administers justice for the fatherless and the widow. And he loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I think those things can be synonymous. Giving justice to the fatherless, those fatherless are strangers. And in Exodus twenty two twenty two, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child, If you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children shall be fatherless. Man, the Lord has a heart for the fatherless. Man, the Lord desires justice for the fatherless. And if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to kind of rapid fire scripture right now concerning the Lord's heart for these little ones who need help. Look at Isaiah 1, 17. Learn to do good. That's something that we're kind of doing today. Okay, we need to learn. Lord, teach us, right? Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. The word defend means to vindicate them and administer justice for them. Defend the fatherless. The Lord says in Job 29, 12, because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. You know, I really feel like I, I am not the expert on this subject today. I just feel so weak going into this sub, sub, subject. Um, but I know that it's a subject for us. And we're going to have actually some special speakers come up at the end of kind of my going through the word here. And they're going to share. And they're more of the experts. And I just feel like, Man, I just don't even have like a ton of stories necessarily for this or a billion statistics or whatever, but many of us do know them. And we know from the word that it is the Lord's heart to be there defending the fatherless and those who in those times of their life, they have no helper. I was in the fifth grade when my dad was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease We went on a fishing trip, and he was just in tons of pain out on the boat in the ocean, and we got back, and we drove right to the hospital, and there they found that he had a grapefruit-sized tumor wrapped around his heart and his lungs, and this would become a few years of battling this disease where he would have radiation and chemotherapy. Eventually, him and my mom would have to leave us and go to Sacramento to go to uh, Stanford University where he would have a bone marrow transplant. As far as I know, he was going to die, and we had to leave my mom and my dad, and we had to go back to our family ranch, and we lived with my aunt and uncle. My aunt and uncle uh, opened up their home to us as we were in a time where we needed help, and they just became uh, mom and dad number two. In fact, my uncle's name was Uncle Rad, (laughs) super cool in the 80s, and we used to call him Uncle Dad, you know? 
And, uh, and they were just, I don't even know that they were doing it out of obedience to the word, but they did that being made in the image of God that was in their heart to be there for the fatherless in our time of need and to help those who had no help. Psalm 68, 15 says that he's a father to the fatherless. My dad ended up passing away later on when I was 19 years old, and that verse really hit me, and I began to pull out these verses in the scripture of his heart for the fatherless. Even though I was a young man, I just still needed my dad, you know? And I remember the Lord just speaking that he was there for me as a father to the fatherless. I just studied a perhaps a few years outdated statistic that there are 400,000 children in the U.S. foster care system, over 100,000 of whom are waiting for and wanting a parent, a parent to adopt them. In Psalm 72, verse 4, he will bring justice to the poor of the people, and he will save the children of the needy. That is something that the Lord does. And it's something that he does through his people. You remember the old song, maybe early 2000s, like, I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I'll go where you lead me. And then another song, you know, if we are the body, why aren't his hands reaching, you know? This is how the Lord moves in communities is through his children, his people, his body, his hands, his feet. We are Christians Christians, which means little Christ. Well, that pastor at Calvary Chapel believes we're all Jesus. You know, no, that's not what I believe. I believe that we have the spirit in us, and now he sends us out to represent him in his power in this world. Psalm 82, 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. There are children who are in the bondage of the wicked. They are in the hands of wicked people. Psalm 10, 14, but you have seen for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. And so, you know, we can just apply this to those that are in trouble. These are little children who are in trouble. They're in grief and sorrow. And the Lord will repay that. We can help teach children how to commit themselves to Jesus because he is the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 107, 41 Yet he sets the poor on high, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. Something that I'm kind of moving towards and just sharing this with you. I believe that the Lord wants to take helpless children in our community and make them the families of a flock. And we'll get there in just a little bit. The virtuous woman of Proverbs 31.20, how many of us went through pre-marriage counseling and and thought, you know, man, is the woman that I'm marrying a virtuous woman? And I just often think about the virtuous woman and how that really does fit my wife very well. And Proverbs 31.20 says, she extends her hands to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. Hosea 14.3, Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. No, will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. This is, there's repentance happening in the very idolatrous, sinful children of Israel. For in you, the fatherless find mercy. Isaiah 32, 7, also the schemes of the schemer are evil. Trying to remember the word that I read. It's like ESV. I don't know if anyone has another translation out there, but The word that they use for this schemer is just really like that guy in the old cartoons with the curly mustache and the pointy nose and the big top hat and just kind of like, you know, (laughs) it's a word like that. The schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But a generous man devises generous things. And by generosity, he will stand. 
I wonder here today, are there any virtuous women? I wonder today, are there any generous men? Jesus was a great example of someone that was put into a blended family. (laughs) Probably like the biggest example there ever was. Like, son of God coming to live with the Brady Bunch here on earth. Okay, you know. Moses is an example of that. Born in a time of genocide. Eventually, mom, Mama Moses, you know, she had, she had no other choice but to put her baby Moses in a basket, send him down the Nile River where God's providence was in hand. The daughter of Pharaoh is out bathing. She sees this basket, opens it up. What a cute little baby. Probably thought, it's going to be so easy. Come on, can we keep him? Can we keep him? You know, whatever. And, I mean, if you know the providence of the Lord, Miriam, Moses' sister, she's watching the whole thing happen from through the reeds. She sees Pharaoh pick up the baby, and Miriam runs out and says, uh, hey, do you want me to go get one of the Hebrew moms to come nurse him? And it turns out it's Moses' mom, and so Moses' mom gets to nurse him and, and grow him up. But it says of, of Pharaoh's daughter in Exodus 1, 6, halfway through, she had compassion on him. So what is looking out for the fatherless? It's having compassion. And then later on in verse uh, 10, Exodus 1.10, the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So Moses was part of the foster system of Egypt. Mephibosheth is someone we read about in 2 Samuel 4.4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. Remember, Jonathan was David's best friend, died in battle. It broke David's heart. And Jonathan had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel that he died in battle. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made her haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. You could write some great rhymes that are tongue twisters about Mephibosheth. Try to spell it. That's a fun one, too. And then in 2 Samuel 9, later on, David says, Is there still anyone who's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Just hop with me here. Down in verse 3, halfway through, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said, Indeed, he is in the house of Mikir, the son of Emiliel, in Lodabar. Then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Mekir, the son of Emiliel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And just hop down for the sake of time. But Mephibosheth, this is at the end of verse 10, Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my tables always. Look at the end of verse 11. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's son. Look down at verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem For he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. So here we have a son. Here we have really David's nephew even. And he's lame. He's helpless. And David graciously, out of a generous heart, seeks after this orphan. Generously just says, you will sit at my table. And you will eat at my table like one of my sons. Sadly, often the Christian family lives by the motto, us four, no more, shut the door. And sometimes we even have those, like this is family day. No friends over, no people over, you know. It's like, I mean, I get it. And I sometimes like, tonight we need to just have some family time. That's okay. But... The heart of the gospel is that we are reaching out and we are pursuing people 
that have no friends. In fact, the word orphan can actually also be translated those who have no friends. Joe, bro, there's hope, man. All right? I was like, who could I make fun of today? It won't really hurt their feelings. Nobody, but we'll go with Joe. Okay. So we go and we reach out to people. They don't have friends. They don't have family. They don't have a home. They don't have loved ones. They got nobody. They have nobody. Song of Solomon says in in that story of Mephibosheth and David reminded me of this. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. He brought me into the banqueting where the table is. And over that, there's just this declaration of his love for me. Galatians tells us in chapter 5, verse 6, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And what that's speaking of is that uh, it's not just the Jews who can come to salvation, but also the Gentiles can come to salvation. And when you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, it's that, Uh, that it's not about race, it's about grace, okay? It's not about the last name Rogers, us four no more, and now it's six, you know, us six, pick up sticks, whatever the rhyme would be, you know? Like, who else needs the love of Jesus? Come on in. And then in Galatians 6, 9, we're told, let us not grow weary while doing good, For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Another just scripture today on my heart, 1 John 3, 17 through 19. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. As we look at the New Testament and we look at the gospel, the good news of the gospel is good news of adoption. Look at Romans 8, 15. For we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, But you receive the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so the good news of the gospel is that we have been adopted into the family of God. And Jesus, the Son of God, shares his inheritance with us. It's kind of a word to kids out there in the families today. No, this is my inheritance. This is my family. This is my childhood. And Jesus, the Son of God, says, come on into the family. You can have it all. This, isn't my, this is ours now. I am sharing it freely with you. You are now an heir. Romans 8, 23 says, and not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption for the, of the body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I love that set of scripture because it's always reminded me of the adoption that's been finalized, right? The papers have been signed or whatnot, but, and, and the little boy or the little girl knows that their new family is coming, but they haven't gotten there yet, right? It's kind of the spot where we're at right now. We've been adopted, we're part of the family, and he's coming back again to take us to be with him. And so we eagerly wait for that day with perseverance. Every day we're at the window, We're just looking for the car to come down the driveway, to turn that corner and come on down. We're looking to the clouds for Jesus to come back with us so that this adoption can just be totally finalized and we are in his presence once for all. The gospel is the gospel of adoption and excitement to be a part of finally coming to this family. Galatians 4.4, we studied this this week, uh, this 
last month for Christmas. This was our Christmas message. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And so the gospel is that we've been saved by Jesus. We've been redeemed and purchased off the auction block of slavery. And no longer are we slaves. We are sons. We are a part of the kingdom. And because we're sons, we are heirs. And we have the inheritance of the promise for us. Just a couple more verses, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 starts out, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. What Ephesians 1 says there is that we have been predestined to adoption. And what that's basically saying is, uh, in the process of adoption, there's a time when the child doesn't know that anyone's coming for him, doesn't know that anyone's thinking of him, doesn't know that there's a pastor in a church somewhere setting forth a plan for a church to go and reach out, right? And, And behind the scenes, There was working, there was plan, there was order, there was preparation. God was doing all of that from before the foundation of the world so that he could come and rescue us from the slum and the orphanage of sin and death and rescue us to himself, making us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says that we were by nature children of wrath just as the others and this is this is probably just way disordered and there's probably a better way to go about this so forgive me but as we're thinking about just even what are you getting at rory i will get there but already you may have some bit of an idea like there's some sort of a heart for the orphan here okay some sort of heart for foster kids something like that but but foster kids man maybe they're disobedient or they've had really hard lives they're going to come in there's going to be a ruckus there's going to be fights my kids won't jive with them and as many concerns that come that are good and valid and true and will probably happen you got to go back to the gospel you got to go back to who you are apart from christ jesus and by nature you were a child of wrath just as the others down in ephesians 2 12 At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Look at verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who are afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Aren't these incredible verses? We're no longer slaves, but sons. We're no longer strangers and foreigners, children of wrath, But now we're fellow citizens. We're part of the family. We've been given a new name. And we are members of the house of God. This is the heart of Jesus. It's his heart for you today. And today, if you came through this door and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you've never received this good news of adoption that's happened to you, you are a child of wrath, you're an outcast, and you have a horrible end awaiting you but the good news is 
Who, who's the, the guy that came and rescued Annie in the movie Annie? Mr. Daddy Warbanks? Warbucks? Banks, Bucks, I think you get the idea. Here comes Daddy Warbucks, right? Jesus came and pursued you while you were still a sinner, and he has brought the adoption to your doorstep. You don't have to be a stranger anymore. You don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You don't have to be a foreigner anymore. You can be brought into the family, be given a new identity that is secure and steadfast in Jesus. Is it the heart of today's message? Number one, it's that will you come and be adopted today? Will you come today and just let him take away your past, take away your failures, take away your bondage, take away all the wrongs that have been done to you and all the wrongs that you've done to him, give you a new nature, give you a new start, give you a new heart? He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Will you come and be adopted today? All you have to do is just run to him. Just run into his arms. Just say, I give up all of this orphanage and stuff of this world that just never has measured up, never was able to take care of me, never fulfilled, and I run to you, Jesus, and I receive all that you have for me in the gospel. Jesus says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's the heart of Jesus. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so what is the vision? The vision on my heart today. It's rough. It's roughshod. It's that every family in this church be a part of foster care or adoption in some way. That meaning you either actively take on a foster child or children, or you begin the process and begin moving towards adopting a child or children and bringing them to your table and teaching them the gospel and not just saying the gospel, but living the gospel. Or that may mean that you become a respite help. You become qualified to assist those who in this church are going to become foster parents and are going to need all the help that they can get. We're going to give you a little card in just a little bit that's going to show all the ways that you can help and be a part of this. But the reason that I'm sharing this today, the Lord has put this on my heart years ago, and I kind of brushed it off. Lindsay and I actually, part of our little story is that we have tried to adopt a few different times. We went through DHS, we went through the foster classes, and the Lord shut that door. We went through uh, trying to adopt out of Burkina Faso, Africa, and uh, we found out we were pregnant with Titus. And so we wrote the organization and we said, um, we're pregnant, but we still want to adopt. We just need, you need to know. And they wrote us back and they said, we've been an adoption agency. We're the only Christian agency in Burkina Faso. We've been an agency for 30 years. And this week we decided to close our doors. And so the Lord closed that door. And then we had a baby and another baby. And we are exhausted from those other two. We've got four kids, just in case you're wondering. But the Lord has been stirring for some time to begin moving in this direction. And I was out working cows a few weeks ago, close to a month ago, and it was with a guy in our body who him and his family are moving towards the foster care life. They were just submitting their application that week, and we began to talk. In a, we, were, we just got done working, and then we were feeding some cows. We were in the hay truck. We just started talking about the gospel. And how adoption and fostering, isn't that the heart of Jesus? Isn't that what he's done for us? And then we went and we worked some more cows, and then we were around this burn barrel. And around this burn barrel, we're warming ourselves up, probably out of seven guys around the burn barrel, something like that, maybe it was five guys. The veterinarian who was there prey checking, Dr. Tony Hyde out of Paisley, 
had been telling us about how him and his family have taken their granddaughter in. Difficult thing, difficult family life has, has made being an empty nester a dream unrealized. But that's the heart of the Lord. And, you know, I think two other men had been through it around that burn barrel. Probably the majority of guys around this burn barrel had, have fostered or adopted children or both. And, and just, I was just feeling the Lord stirring up. A couple guys around the burn barrel weren't even believers, and we were just talking about how the gospel is adoption. It's a story of adoption. Or adoption is the story of the gospel. And the reason that I'm sharing this is since that time, I felt just the Lord stirring in my heart that this is a direction the Lord wants to call every able family. In, in one of these capacities, every able family moved this direction to help the helpless. And I share this this week because not this Monday, but next Monday, we start a five-day fast as a church where we're gathering three times a day and we're seeking the Lord for our church, for our nation, for our world, for our families, for directions, for things that we've got going on in our lives. And we are crying out to the Lord with desperation. And I want to ask you, during that time of fasting, and it might look different for you. You might, you might be doing no food all week. You might be just fasting from one meal that week. Just some way, be involved with us in the fast. You can talk to me what that might look like for you. Just maybe come as much as you can and join the prayer. But during that week of prayer and fasting, I just ask that leaders of the homes here be intentionally talking and praying with your spouse and families about how you might be involved in this. Certainly not every family is probably going to be able to do it. Some have newborn babies. It's just not the right time. I get that. I've been there. Lots of stuff going on. There's no condemnation to anyone who's just not there. But now's the time God is giving a vision, and he's calling our church to seek the Lord about it. And Isaiah 58, 6 says, Is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness? to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? This would be a fast where you allow the Lord to work in you, giving towards others in an extra measure. Charles Spurgeon was at an evening prayer meeting, and he said, we are a large church and should be doing more for the Lord in this great city. I want us to ask God to send us some new work. So the people in the remainder of the prayer time prayed, quote, oh God, please send us some new work. And the work God sent them ended up being the Stockwell Orphanage which had a very huge impact on the children of London. And so we're going to, that, that's the vision, all right? That's looking at the scripture, looking at what pure and undefiled religion before God looks like. It's rooted in the gospel, and then it pours out to others. That's the call to you, church, to spend time. I don't want a yes or no right now. I just want you to seek the Lord with me for this. And if it's not even for your family, then will you seek the Lord for this for our church? Someone just mentioned recently, as we've been having to just figure out, what are we doing in the midst of all of this crazy pandemic? And, and just, this is what the Lord has led us to do right now, okay? It's been a lot of wrestling. It's been fasting. What do we do? Everyone mask up. Nobody mask up. Some people mask up. Different services, six-foot spacing. This is what the Lord has led us to do for now. And just, it was mentioned, like, well, do we want to be known as the church that's a super spreader event? And certainly, we don't want to be known as a church that, you know, people are dying of the coronavirus. But the question must be asked, what do we want to be known as, as a church? I'll tell you, 
I want to be known as the church that is preaching the gospel with fervency. I hope we're known as a church now that's out on the street with signs of life, bringing a message of hope in a time of especially awful days. And I feel like the Lord's saying in this season, I want you to be known as a church that is bending over backwards and laying your lives down with radical generosity. That's what the Lord wants us to be known for. We got, man, I was with uh, Lindsay and Jess last night. I was like, what, church, what families do we have in the church that are already doing something like this? They, they've got these and these and these. And I was thinking of the Box family. Kenny Box. He has worked two jobs at times and is taking care of two of his grandchildren. And, and the first of the grandchildren came into their life right before they were becoming empty nesters. I mean, they, light was at the end of the tunnel. And if you know the story, it's been a hard season for the Box family. Carrie can't come to church most of the time because she can't keep track of these little ones in the different places where we are. It's been a hard season for them, but they've, they're just still enduring. Kenny's still serving the kids. I know there's other people represented here taking care of grandchildren, taking care of nieces and nephews, adoptions, and, and it's happening in our body. And I think even in this, the Lord wants us to raise up to help those that can't come to church because they can't, physically I can't move and I can't keep care of my foster grandbabies, my grandbabies. I wasn't expecting this at this season in my life. We're here for you. We're coming after you. And so we're going to take, can you give me 20 more minutes today? Okay, good. 20 more minutes because this is the good part, okay? Uh, We're going to invite two different uh, families and members of families to come and share a little bit about what foster and adoption has meant to them and for their families. And uh, Russell, why don't you get that video video ready uh, because we're going to share um, a video uh, about the McCaw family and a ministry they were part of in the town that they just came from. Uh, If you don't know the McCaw family, uh, they are new to the community uh, about a year now and they're going to share in just a minute. They're from Newburgh, and um, they've just been a real blessing to us in our time getting to know them. And so watch this little video about them and foster the love here. We are Matt and Shannon McCaw, and we're foster parents, and we have been for about 10 years. And about a year ago, um, we were part of forming a tribe around foster care and adoption in our church with three other families. And me and Shannon do foster care because there's a huge need in our community. Um, There are kids, lots of kids in, in Yamhill County that, for whatever reason, they can't be with their family anymore. Their family can't take care of them. They don't have relatives. They don't have friends of their family that can take care of them. They have nobody. In a real sense, these are orphans, the orphans in our community that have nobody to take them in. Um, But we can take them in, and we feel like, as Christians, we need to be the people that are taking these kids in. Um, So that's why we do foster care. You know, you're doing something that God has directly called all of us to do. You're really feeling like you're you're doing God's work, and you can't go wrong there. So we've had 40 kids come through our, our home in the last 12 years, and uh, it's been a real eye opener for our family. Um, we we're able to adopt two of them. Our two youngest are adopted out of the foster care system. So it's taught our older kids uh, a lot of compassion and nurturing, and <clears throat> kind of an eye opener for them to see the goods and the bads uh, of the system. The the stories our tribe has to tell of of just these kids coming with no shoes on their feet and just the clothes on their back. And um, we have this opportunity to love on them and to care for them and to be that soft place to fall. And um, it's hard, but at the same time, it's amazing what you see. Even just in a few months sometimes with these kiddos living in our house, they change from not wanting to smile and being afraid to do so many things to just loving life, loving each um, other kids and just even loving Jesus. I 
remember each of those special times when um, the first night up in our loft at Bible Story, every night, sometimes it'll be months, and then they'll finally be like, can I pray tonight? And those just warm my heart. Most of the kids um, that come into care um, don't know attachment, and so our job as foster parents is to introduce what attachment looks like, and that looks like unconditional love, meeting them where they're at, and their behaviors. And so you love hard, and you give hard, and then you grieve hard when they leave. It's literally changed every aspect of our life. We've experienced our highest highs and our lowest lows, like in parenthood and in our marriage, in our faith. Right now, there's 29 non-relative foster families in Yamhill County, uh, and it's not nearly enough. There's more kids than there are families to put them. Um, all the, the families in our tribe have been full almost the whole year that we've been together. We're full right now, um, and you still get calls because DHS has no place to put them. Just last week, um, Shannon was out of town. I was home by myself uh, with the kids and DHS called knowing that I was full, that we had, you know, our house was full, um, and but they had two kids that they had no place to put them, and she was, you know, flat out just said, Matt, I'm begging you, can you take these kids? And I couldn't, um, but it just shows the need, that, that there's a, a big need for safe homes for these kids. Yeah. People tell us, oh, you do foster care. I could never do that because I would get too attached to the kids when they have to go home. And I just think that's exactly what these kids need is somebody to attach to them that way because kids need that kind of love. All our kiddos do. The kids in our homes, the kids in your homes. You know, and I would encourage people if they've ever thought, you know, this is something that I think that I could do. I'm here to tell you it's not easy, but it's definitely worth it and we feel like all of the children that have come through our home, not only have we helped them and impressed upon their lives and their hearts, but they've done the same to ours. And we have a hallway in our home that has every picture of every child that's come through our home that we pray for regularly. So I feel like God's still able to work in their lives even when they're not in our home because we're praying regularly for each child. about foster care um, and uh, so we jump at any chance I, I don't love public speaking but I jump at any chance to talk about foster care um, and encourage people to get into it um, we've got six kids we have three that are uh, birth children we've adopted one out of the foster care system we have two foster daughters right now that we're in the process of adopting and um, like I said we've been doing foster care for a while um, we know the system really well and, and I know that that a lot of people hear a lot of things about foster care and there's a lot of scary things and there's a lot of um, negative stories. Um, but when Rory asked us to share something um, about foster care, we felt like if there was one thing we wanted to share about foster care is the giant need that there is. Um, most of the problems from the foster care system boil down to the fact that there's not enough families for the kids that are out there. Um, and that's why we made this video in our old home um, because there was just way more kids than there were families. And um, we've since moved. We, we, we moved this last summer to get a culture change and uh, we got it and we love it here. Um, it's different here and, and we're really happy. But um, one of the things that we found is that uh, though it's different here, one thing that's still the same, is there's more kids than there are families to take them. So I just wanted to share with you a few statistics the, um, about the local. So um, in this area in Central Oregon, it's called District 10. So Deschutes, Crook, and Jefferson share children, um, you know, because different homes. And so um, just in terms of the 
the need, there's currently, so I reached out to DHS and there are currently 265 children in foster care in those three counties right now. 40% of those, they've had relatives that were able to step up, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, great aunt. We had a, a couple of foster boys that we thought we were gonna adopt and this great aunt that they'd never met stepped up in a town far away <laughs> from where they lived and those kids were able to go there. So there are relatives that are stepping up all over the place, but 60% of those kids are in general foster homes and um, so then in terms of, you know, if we break down just in terms of the numbers, you know, a lot of those kids are in Deschutes County, which makes sense. That's where a lot of the population is. 32 of those kids are coming from Crook County, and 50 of those kids um, are in um, Jefferson County. And so what's crazy is this, these next numbers. So when you look at how many homes are available for those children, the people that are certified foster parents, there are 61 um, county, uh, homes, non-relative provider homes in Deschutes, nine homes with us being one of those in Crick County, but we're full, like six kids, our car doesn't hold anymore. We were just talking to Casey, we need to get the big van. But then <laughs> our worry is we would just keep taking kids because what's crazy is like last week, I, I sent a screenshot to Rory of an email I got from the District 10, they had three families worth of kids, two sets of three and a set of two kids. They had no placements for any of them. All of the homes were full. Nobody could take them. And they're reaching out to us and we're like, we just can't, we can't do it. And, you know, we can't keep, you know, at some point, now, you know, there's families that do, there's families that step up and have 10, 12. And, but, you know, we have other, you know, so those nine homes in Crick County, you know, I was looking up just, you know, in the video there, how many churches are there in Prineville, you know, and there's 20 churches in Prineville. I know a lot of those are small, but still it's kind of crazy. I was like, if Christians aren't stepping up to do this, who is, you know, and, um, of those nine homes, you know, where, you know, to put kids in. And then what's, I don't know if you remember the number from the last slide, but only three homes in Jefferson County that are foster providers, um, non-relative, which means those 50 kids that were in Jefferson County in foster care obviously aren't just in those three homes. So there were other counties are having to help out Jefferson County in that way. So, um, so my kiddos right now are gonna hand out um, to the adults. They have a little card um, that I wanted to, you know, we're not again today asking, I know you can't read that, it's too small probably, but um, uh, so if they, they're gonna give cards to the adults here, is, I think we have enough. This is a full church today. So um, we really want to, um, Hadley, Hadley, just you can hand out to, uh, so, um, <laughs> you look like a kid there. She, did, <laughs> she, she just walked right by. You must be under 18. <laughs> um, you know, really just to stick this card in your Bible or on the fridge or really, you know, thinking about ways that it, you don't... The, it, the only way isn't to become a foster home. There's actually a lot of different ways to support foster families. One of the things that people ask, how do you keep doing it? And what we had always say when we were in Newburgh is we had a community that came around us. So when we got a placement, we didn't have to worry about gathering clothes for those kids or people would bring us meals like we just had a new baby. Like it was all of that stuff. We had a, a community, be that relatives, my parents live next door, you know, like, but all our friends, people stepped up to help us. And that's part of this is, making it doable for some families means the rest of us have to step up to provide for those families. Um, respite care, we've always talked about. We had people that our kids trusted, they, our kids knew. You aren't going to just drop your kids off at some respite provider to have a few hour break if your kids don't know them. And so having a community where somebody, you have to get certified to be a respite. It's an easy, you know, background check and it's not the whole 24 hours of classes. But um, but those kind of things where, you know, we had people that were willing to be our respite providers that even for us to go have a night in a hotel away from six, you know, um, Casey and I were talking about this. Like we're not up here to tell you foster care is easy. <laughs> like it's not easy, but with a community behind you, it can definitely be easier. Um, so um, there's also every child, and we'll talk more about this. What we're really thinking is we're wanting you to pray about like where might you fit in this and that in February after the week of fasting we want to have some get togethers where you could ask questions and and you know kind of even as a church maybe go through the classes together because they're virtual now so they're a lot more a lot easier to do versus you know having to fit into a s specific schedule so um, the last one on the list is kindred connections and so Casey uh, McKinnon and her family are going to share a little bit about um um, their experience there, um, and that's another opportunity to help really those kids and families that are struggling. So, yeah. Well, 
if he doesn't like public speaking, I really don't like public speaking. <laughs> uh, about 10 years ago, I was uh, in the process of preparing for a mission trip to Uganda, um, which was going to be primarily centered around an orphanage um, in uh, Jinja that was founded by Kathy Vaughn, who attends this church when she's here. Um, and that, uh, that trip definitely started us on the path of international adoption. And we know that that's not the, um, the focus of our talk up here today. We, we knew that God had a plan then, um, but uh, if you want to talk about international adoption, you can visit with us afterwards or whenever you want. Um, fast forward to about uh, five years ago, um, Casey and I felt called to, be, um, to become part of a local fo foster care prevention ministry um, here that comes alongside families in need and provides temporary hosting um, of their children. And uh, I think this is where you come in. <laughs> um, in 2015, that organization was called um, Safe Families for Children. And uh, since then, it's changed its name. It's now called Kindred Connections. And it's under this umbrella of JBARJ Youth Services, which is based in Bend. But one of the things we love about Kindred Connections is that all of the um, all of the hosting, all the hospitality, the relationships, and the generosity, that that's all gospel-centered. Um, it really is the love of Christ that motivates volunteers to rally around a family, um, a family in crisis, and provide family-like support. Um, I have, we both have great extended families. I look out at this extended family and just think of if anything happened to my family and we're in crisis we've got such a huge network of people that would come alongside us but it's just not the truth for a lot of families and so um, a, a family in crisis they might be just sinking under the burden of single parenting or homelessness unemployment recovering from addiction hospitalization or even incarceration and that is the idea of Kindred Connections, is that um, parents would, be, would voluntarily place their children in certified host, fam host homes, um, but they would be keeping custody and that the ultimate goal would be fam family preservation. And so um, the, the referrals might come from DHS or a law enforcement officer. Um, or the school counselor or someone like that that can see this family struggling and know that if they stay on the path they're on, their, their kids are headed to be, um, headed into the, the foster care system. And so this just provides an opportunity, a lifeline to keep those kids and that family um, on a firm foundation. So it's the whole family approach that is so beautiful. Um, volunteers are screened and trained but not compensated. So that's just another key difference between them. Okay, we stepped into the host family role, which kind of means that um, we, uh, we went through some training. It was like four or five hours. Um, we went, had some interviews and even a home inspection to make sure our, our home was safe, but that's just not the only way that you can be involved. And so some of these other roles kind of give you an idea of how um, like a family advocate would be that person that, okay, while we're focused on caring for the kids and keeping that ship afloat, <laughs> someone else would come alongside that parent that needs to find an apartment, that needs to get a job, that, you know, is seeking treatment for addiction or whatever that would be. Um, and then we get into those more support and resource volunteers that are kind of doing the, um, doing the, some logistical things, like Shannon was talking, a tribe around the family in need, a tribe around the host families, and 
Um, also just resources, providing resources like di diapers and meals and clothes or shoes or uh, a pack and play or whatever, whatever that would look like. Um, here in Prineville, this, this program is kind of still in the bubbling stages. I think um, I double checked yesterday and there's three host homes in Crook County and a few of these other people that have become certified as well, but that's really as we can build this foundation, another role that we need here in Prineville is this community liaison, um, somebody that would start to cultivate some relationships with some people that might refer and be able to share the heart of, um, of our churches and our families in doing that. Um, On a more personal note. <laughs> so I think it's been said several times that uh, really none of this is easy, and that's, that's the truth. Um, for me personally, um, you know, just the word idolatry in this comes to mind for me um, through our adoption, or all of our adoptions, um, just a protection, a desire to protect my family from from unrest, from drama, from anything that the outside might bring in. It's a hard, a hard thing um, for me to deal with. And, you know, it, it really just exposed my disbelief and my um, unreliance on God. And, and that became apparent and something that I need to, needed to draw closer to Christ in. And, and it can, it can really, um, it can really strip things away from you in a, in a good in a good way, and uh, so definitely. I think um, for us going into both our adoptions and the ho and the hosting through Kindred Connections, um, this verse on the top just um, to whom much is given, much will be required. That was just firmly in the front of our mind. I mean, there was just a lot of things I needed to go out and do for God, you know. And um, God, just in his graciousness, just used that as a starting point, but really brought it around, brought it around and showed us um, what the Lord wanted to do in us <laughs> just as much. And so for me personally, I know speaking for Mark too, but um, through adding this to our plate, it definitely has been a means of sanctification um, in our personal lives. And uh, we talk about idolatry, <laughs> um, but what, what this really did is force me to a place of really recognizing um, my own idols, um, order maybe, and control, <laughs> all those things, and really forcing, giving some depth to my reliance on the Lord and knowing that he can and will um, work in that. To the point now where I... I um, look at this picture. This is a picture of our kids during a hosting, and um, and even just our family now. And I really just this verse more accurately sums up what what I think of when I think of it. And just all things have been created through Him and for Him. And Jesus Christ is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Only by the grace of God. It's this picture. It's a picture of our kids. It's a picture of a couple little girls we love. But it's actually a picture of God's faithfulness. That's definitely how we feel. So I have um, some materials, additional materials. If you want to take a look at it, I have some frequently asked questions about safe families, kindred connections. I have just a, a short um, page if you are interested in being a host family. I'd love to talk to you. Sarah Teske, she could talk to you um, and just kind of share what our experiences have been and how to be involved in, in that. So. Thanks for having us. We'll have the worship team come back up, and uh, you guys want to stand with me as the team is coming up? <laughs> 